Well, friends, New Year, same old Sean Shonson PS1 wheelbase goodness. It's time for Japan only PS1 games, volume number nine. And at this rate, we've only got, I don't know, a few hundred more episodes of this series to get through. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be fun. As always, we're going to take a look at three Japan only games chosen entirely at random and one viewer selection, which is also chosen at random. But there are less games to choose from, so, uh, the odds are better. Frankly, there's no better way to kick off the new year than with a few games from the land of good games. So dust off your pocket stations, unravel your limited edition Pingu controllers, and spin your game of life pad because it's game time, and the wheel will provide. <laughs> The wheel will provide. Starting things out this volume, we have the wonderfully titled Tokyo Insect Zoo, which made its way to the PlayStation in March of the year 1996. It was both published and developed by a studio called GE, and no, not Jack Donaghy's GE, but a company by the name of General Entertainment. Dreamcast fans might know these guys for developing the launch titles Godzilla Generations, as well as the penguin racing game Pen Pen Tricellion, which is, uh, about as weird as it sounds. FMV aficionados might also know them for their work on games like Alive on the PS1 and the absolutely bonkers Combat Queens on the PS2. Seriously, you should check all these games out if you get a chance. You will not be disappointed. So, going by what I just said, it's safe to say that when you see the general entertainment logo on screen, you're usually in for a wild ride. And well, even the logo itself can make that very apparent. So, what is Tokyo Insect Zoo? Well, the game itself describes it as a playing movie game, and yeah, that's pretty much what we got, a movie that you play. Now, full disclosure, before I even picked this game to add to the wheel, I kind of knew it was going to be a no gaijin game, and yes, it is very much a no gaijin game. Not only is the whole thing in Japanese, but all dialogue and story in this game is conveyed through spoken words, so I can't even rely on Google Lens to fumble my way through this one. Heck, the game doesn't even have any menus, no save functionality, not even any way to pause it. It is very much as described, a playing movie game. Now, taking all this into consideration, why would I even pick a game like this? Well, I mean, look at it. Sometimes a game seems so strange and interesting that you want to try it out even if you know you can't fully understand it. And well, Tokyo Insect Zoo is one of those games. And to my surprise, it turns out you can kind of get through this game just fine even if you don't understand Japanese. Sure, you won't have a clue what's going on, but hey, it's something at least. Thankfully, we do have the internet though, so I can at least detail a little bit about what's going on here. In Tokyo Insect Zoo, you play as a small boy named Ryo, who one day after having a conversation with a mysterious woman, falls asleep and then inexplicably finds that he has been shrunk down and turned into a beetle. After some brief exploration, we come across some other friendly insects, the brothers Brew and Zucca, and a girl named Orga. From here, you learn that you are actually in a location known as the Tokyo Insect Zoo, a safe haven for insects located within, uh, Tokyo. Who would have guessed? After palling around with your newfound insect friends and doing cool insect things, you eventually learn that the Tokyo Insect Zoo is set to be destroyed, and the story actually takes a pretty heavy turn with themes surrounding death, reincarnation, and the apocalypse, and if that seems kinda heavy for a game aimed at kids, well, yeah, it is actually. But hey, if animals of farting wood could scar me for life, why can't a cute insect game too, you know? 
Now, of course, this brief synopsis doesn't really do the full plot justice, as pretty much every conversation that took place in the game flew right over my head, but if the story sounds interesting to you and you can understand spoken Japanese, well then you're probably in for a treat. As for the game itself, well, it's mostly a mixture of two different styles. We have your traditional visual novel elements, which are mostly reserved for dialogue between characters. As mentioned, no text appears on screen while playing this game, so dialogue choices are actually selected using the shoulder buttons. There's no real way of knowing what you're going to say when choosing them, and some choices seem to play internal monologues, while others are spoken out loud to other characters. But as far as I can tell, there's no real branching paths or dialogue trees per se, so in most cases, choosing every available option is all you really need to do to progress further in the conversation and keep the game moving forward. As you may have noticed, the game has some pretty stellar character designs and animations, and that's because they were all designed by famed animation studio Perot, who worked on anime adaptations such as Naruto and Bleach, and everything here was created exclusively for this game, and it's no surprise that the work here is top notch during all the still scenes or the many, many animated segments that appear throughout the game. Unfortunately, the PS1 video compression hasn't been the kindest to it over the years, but it is still a treat for fans of that distinct 90s anime style. The rest of the game actually plays somewhat similarly to a walking simulator. Early on in the game, you get to explore some cool environments in your human form, but it's not long until you're shrunk down and exploring things from the perspective of a tiny little insect. You get to roam through grassy fields, hang out with some scorpions in the desert, chat to spiders in the forest, or even explore through vast sewer systems. This part to me is what really made me want to try out this game, even if I knew I couldn't truly get the most out of it. One thing that I always love doing in video games, especially early three-dimensional games, is exploring the environments and just having a little look around and taking it all in. And in a game like this, where you get to experience things from a unique shrunk down perspective with strange bugs and creatures roaming around, some in 3D and some in 2D, I don't know, I just found this kind of neat. Now granted, these segments have pretty much nothing in the way of any true gameplay outside of a few segments that let you jump around and do some platforming and the odd time where you'll need to tap some shoulder buttons to fly off to new locations. Everything else is pretty much just wandering around until you trigger a new conversation or cutscene and then do it again on repeat. But regardless, it's still one of those games that keeps you on your toes, constantly taking you to new and strange locations, and even just outright bringing you straight into the realms of psychedelia at times. Honestly, some of the things that you'll see in this game, you'd swear LSD was actually the sequel to this game. As for the sound, well, as I already mentioned, all the dialogue in this game is voiced, and even though I can't understand it, you can tell the actors were having a pretty good time doing this one. There's some scenes in particular that will bring a smile to your face regardless of what language you speak. That being said though, the audio quality on the voices did seem a little lacking, almost like they were kinda tinny and echoey at times. I guess that may be the result of squeezing the game onto a single disc, which likely explains the compression on the animated scenes too. It is a little disappointing, but hey, it's at least understandable. The music, on the other hand, is pretty high quality. While it's not exactly something I listen to outside of the game, we do get a nice mixture of lighthearted and whimsical tracks and some darker, more atmospheric music to kind of juxtapose the different locales and the themes of the game. All in all, it's pretty good. So yeah, that's about it for Tokyo Insect Zoo, very much a non-import friendly title, but still one that I enjoyed playing even if it was just to experience being a bug in a trippy polygonal universe. Although truthfully for most people, this is a hard one to recommend. The whole thing only takes about an hour or two to see to the end, and if you wanted to experience it all, the FMV and gameplay is online too, so you can kind of get the full experience there since the game doesn't really require you to do anything beyond just 
walking from place to place, but hey, if that sounds appealing to you, who am I to tell you what to try? Plus, you never know, maybe one day it will get a fan dub or even some in-game subtitles. Heck, even some subtitles on a YouTube video would be enough to experience it somewhat. But for now, Tokyo Insect Zoo remains a quirky, strange trip into the life of a bug. And at the very least, I quite enjoyed the journey, even if I left feeling more confused than when I began. Wheel will provide. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you the jazziest tennis game around. It's World Pro Tennis 98, which, can I just shock you, made its way to the PlayStation in 1998. This game was both published and developed by a team called Magnolia Corp. There's not much information available about them online, but they dedicated this game to tennis fans everywhere, so they seem like nice people. Now, I can already hear a number of you at home. Come on, Sean. Tennis? Of all the cool Japan-only games out there ripe for the picking, you're gonna talk about a sports game. And to you I say, yes, the wheel doesn't discriminate. We love all games here on Sean Shonson's wild Japanese PlayStation ride, except pachinko games. We, we still hate pachinko games. Now truthfully, I have quite the soft spot for tennis games. Some of my favorite sports games of all time are tennis games, in particular, the many Mario Tennis titles, especially those Game Boy ones, Sega's excellent Virtua Tennis series, and the underappreciated Sega Superstar Tennis, which is pretty much just Virtua Tennis, but full to the brim with Sega fan service. And if we're going to talk about the PS1, I think it's a safe bet to say Namco's trilogy of Smash Court games are probably the console's best option for tennis aficionados. Also, they feature some of Namco's finest music on the console too, and considering this is Namco we're talking about, that's really saying something. <laughs> Now here's the thing, all those tennis games I just spoke about, they all share one thing in common. They're all arcade style tennis games, with an emphasis on fun and accessibility, over well trying to bring a true to life tennis experience to your home console. And this is where World Pro Tennis 98 comes into play. It's a tennis game made by tennis fans for tennis fans. And while nowadays I'm sure tennis games have evolved to the state where they are about as accurate as they possibly could be, I personally wouldn't know since I'm still playing Mario Tennis. Back on the PS1, it was a struggle to find games that offered a decent simulation of a real life sport, while also overcoming the limitations of early 3D game design. So keeping all that in mind, let's see how World Pro Tennis 98 holds up all these years later. Now, when it comes to modes, things are relatively bare bones for the most part. World Pro Tennis 98 offers up three options from the main menu. We got your standard exhibition match, tournament mode, and a training mode. Training mode would probably be a good place to start since it helps us learn our tennis fundamentals. Starting out, we have a tutorial, which even without any Japanese knowledge is pretty easy to understand. All four of the face buttons represent different types of shots from your standard hit to power strikes, slices, and volleys. You can alter the direction of your shots and increase their power using the D-pad while pressing an input. It's all pretty basic stuff, but even in this limited form, it gives you a lot of options and control over how you want to play the ball. Beyond this, serving the ball functions more or less the same. Press any of the four face buttons to throw the ball in the air, and depending on which face button you press when hitting it over to your opponent, a different type of serve will be performed. And outside of using the L1 and L2 buttons to change the angles and positions of your camera, yeah, that covers the basics really. It's tennis. 
who would have guessed? Now where things get a bit more interesting are a few of the more pro elements the game gives you access to. First off, depending on your positioning and timing when you return the ball to your opponent, this can also drastically change the power and direction of your shot. The game even tells you that this is a trickier technique and not to worry too much about it at the start, but for players who are very aware of the positions of their character, the racket and the ball, this is just another element that allows you more control over the gameplay. And finally, probably the element that piqued my interest the most is the ability to use the R1 and R2 buttons to control the height of your shots. So for example, you can use the R1 button to aim your ball higher and the R2 button to aim your ball lower on almost any type of shot. And doing this allows you almost complete control of every aspect of the ball, allowing for some crazy precision. And pressing both R1 and R2 together allows you to boot the ball over the net as well. I'm sure there's a technical term for this type of shot, but I just prefer to call it booping. So as you can see, on a basic level, it's your standard tennis game for the most part, but these extra little pro features allow so much extra control and choice compared to a standard tennis game, you can see why tennis fans might dig what this game is offering. Now of course, to practice all these techniques, the game does give you a few training modes as well, including a wall mode, an auto shot mode, and some service training as well, which allows you to knock down cups, which is very, very satisfying. Once you're comfortable with your newfound tennis skills, you can then bring them into exhibition mode, which allows you to choose from either singles or doubles tennis action for one to four players. You've got a selection of up to four different difficulties and three different types of court, hard, clay, and grass. And when it comes to the roster of selectable characters, well, we've got a choice of 32 men, no playable women, unfortunately. We do got some uh, kind of familiar faces here, complete with a few minor misspellings to avoid any copyright or legal disputes. But what's cool about each of the selectable characters in this game is that these stats all drastically change how the character plays and controls. In most games, the stats usually increase minor parameters to speed, strength, and whatnot, but here, they affect swing and serve timing, shot angles, a whole host of different things. So trying one character and then moving on to another can feel like you're learning the game from the ground up all over again. Now, I don't want to make it seem like World Pro Tennis 98 is the Rolls Royce of PS1 tennis games, but in terms of systems and techniques, it is far beyond anything else that I've played on the console. And as such, seeing as I've limited real life tennis knowledge and have been called by arcade tennis games all my life, Naturally, I'm pretty terrible at it. It took me a long time to get used to the inputs and controls, and if the AI was entrancing me, I was probably setting myself up for failure on the regular too. But of course, I can't just quit a game because I'm bad at it, can I? So, after a lot of practice, I eventually started getting the hang of things, albeit on the easy difficulty, but trust me, it still didn't feel all that easy to me. Now, when you think you're good enough and are ready to leave the safety of exhibition mode, you can then move on to the game's main single-player component, the tournament mode. Here you choose one of the game's many characters and try to work your way through a series of tournaments based on their real life counterparts with the goal of becoming the world number one. And look, if you like playing challenging tennis and want to be the very best, like no one ever was, well let me tell you, there is a lot to keep you busy here. Winning tournaments, earning points, and seeing your character move up the rankings after some hard fought victories is always a nice feeling. And most importantly, you can also taunt and slam your racket whenever you lose a round. So if you like being a jerk, that's also possible too. You can even run over to your opponent's side and make an ass of yourself. It's great. As for the content, well, that's about all World Pro Tennis 98 has to offer. Truthfully, at its core, it's a relatively bare-bones tennis game. The 32 characters don't look all that different from one another outside of some minor clothing choices. The three available courts are all pretty much palette swaps in the same location, so much so that you can even swap the court mid-game if you like, which is actually kind of cool, really. And outside of the amazing lounge jazz that plays in the menus, the rest of the game is just tennis sounds and polite crowd noise, which... To its credit, is what tennis sounds like, if we're being fair. It's clear that this game was made by a small but very passionate development team, and while the package and presentation is rather limited and bare bones to say the least, especially when compared to other PS1 tennis titles like Smash Court, it's clear the effort and focus was put entirely into the tennis gameplay itself, and even though in many ways it's not the type of tennis game I would normally gravitate towards, once you try and understand its complex and well taught out systems, there's still no denying the care and effort that was put into making this the definitive PS1 tennis game for hard hardcore tennis fans, and if you're a hardcore tennis fan, well this import friendly tennis game that features some very, very smooth jazz is definitely worth a look.
that we will provide. Hope you guys are in the mood for something strange because next up we have a little known game called Metaflist Mu X 2297 which made its way to the PlayStation in January of the year 1997. And I suppose before we dig into this game I should note that not only is there very little information about this game online but what info there is is often under an incorrect title. The game is commonly known as Metaflist Gamma X 2097, whether we're looking at long plays, game facts, or the video game library, and even the PSX database. But looking at the game's cover, we can see that it should actually be Metaflist Mu X 2297. That's what the Japanese PlayStation website has it as anyway, so who am I to disagree with them? So, Metaflist might be one of the most interesting games the wheel has ever chosen for us. On the surface, it looks like a pretty generic vertical shoot em up, something that the console certainly isn't lacking in its library by any means. But dig a bit deeper, and Metaflist reveals itself to be one of the most ambitious shoot em ups ever made, and also maybe one of the strangest. Chameleon, chameleon, whatever you are, whatever you are, the drink that lasts a whole 24 hours long. You don't need air. Wow! Don't need sun. Really? A limited fun, so it's no problem. Gotta get me some. Add some excitement to your life. The number one drink in space. Chameleon, it's a miracle taste. Okay, it's definitely one of the strangest. So this game is the product of a development team called ADM. I can't find any information about them online whatsoever. So as far as I'm aware, this is the only game that they ever made. Now, as we've already mentioned, Metaflist at its core is a vertical shoot 'em up. You go from level to level shooting bad guys using a variety of different weapons. You've got your standard shot, which fires in a spread pattern, a laser shot, which is a more concentrated pattern, and you've also got missiles, which you can use the paint targets and are also required for attacking enemies below your ship. All three of the weapons are available from the get-go and can be cycled through on command. Nothing too unusual so far. Something a little bit more interesting though is your ability to aim in a full 360 degrees around your ship by using the shoulder buttons to rotate your cursor, meaning you can attack enemies from pretty much any direction you like, all while maintaining separate control of your ship's movement. It's certainly not the first or last game to try something like this, but I've always quite liked this type of separate aiming and movement dynamic in shooters whenever it does appear. Now you may have noticed the game is a little uh, busy, I guess you could say. Metaflist isn't really a game that takes itself too seriously, or maybe it does, I'm not 100% sure, but one thing I know for certain is that the developers wanted to make something wild. For example, every now and then you might come across a power up for one of your three weapons. These are temporary, but instead of powering up your weapon a little bit, look how big your shots get. This is absolutely insane. In fact, I'd almost call this taking the piss a little bit. Also, check out this game's versions of bombs, which the game refers to as go to hell bombs. So yeah, clearly there's a lot going on here, from the music to the visuals, this is for all intents and purposes. Kind of a mess, right? A shoot 'em up purist nightmare, but in a way, it's so overtly dumb and over the top that I kinda love it. And that's Metaflist in a nutshell. It's one of the dumbest shooters I've ever played. In fact, it's a fucking mess, but it's damn proud of it. The levels and visuals are at times so chaotic and intense that there's no way to fully keep track of everything. The bosses literally just awkwardly flow onto the screen and are, for the most part, just different shapes attached together that fire lasers at you. Levels can last on average anywhere from two to three minutes and end seemingly at random with you just getting whisked away out of nowhere. And sometimes you might even just get whisked away to a completely different level. And in some very rare cases, you'll end the level before you even fight an enemy. Confused yet? You should be. 
Because here's the kicker, Metaflist isn't just a bonker shoot 'em up, it's also a shoot 'em up with RPG elements and a persistent leveling up system, a map screen with multiple planets to visit and a number of different levels contained within each. And guess what? It also has a deep story played out through a ton of different cutscenes that's so big it spans two PlayStation discs. A story driven shoot 'em up that covers two whole discs. Have you ever in your life heard of such a thing? And here's the best part. The entire story is fully voiced in English. And not only that, the voice acting isn't even that bad. Seen this kind of terminal before. We can get some good shit out of it. So as you can see, when I said Metaflist was one of the most ambitious shoot 'em ups ever made, I wasn't lying. Of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that the game isn't a mess, it's 100% a mess, but my god, it is an ambitious mess. So we already know the deal with the shoot 'em up gameplay, right? Well, let's now talk about some of the deeper systems at play. So the idea is that in Metaflist, you're at war with an enemy army and you're constantly in a sort of tug of war for control of the galaxy. When you enter into a battle, you'll see this meter in the top right corner. This is meant to represent your control over the front line. The more enemies that get by you, the more the meter moves towards the red. The more enemies you destroy, the more it moves towards the blue. The goal is to finish each level with the meter in the blue. Do so and you win a level. End it in the yellow and the level is a draw. End it in the red and then that's a loss for your army. When you finish a mission, you'll see a meter at the top called Frontline, and depending on your results in that mission, the meter will either increase or decrease. Winning battles across the map increases the meter bit by bit, drawing or losing will decrease it, and if the meter falls to 0%, it's game over, and if the meter gets to 100%, you can then enter the final battle and beat the game. Now, of course, that's just the general gist of things. There's obviously a few more aspects at play here. For one, there's the RPG systems that we previously mentioned. Now, at the beginning of the game, your ship's weapons and shield begin at level one, and instead of lives, your ship has a shield gauge. Now, your ship can take quite a number of hits before it gets destroyed, which is a good thing because dying once ends the game outright, and there's also no way to save, by the way, so uh, don't die. After you complete a mission, your shield regenerates a little bit of its meter, but it also levels up so you can take more hits. As for your weapons, these also level up individually depending on how much you use them, meaning if you focus on one particular weapon, that weapon's strength, fire pattern and shot size will increase sporadically throughout the game. And this is permanent too, assuming that you don't die that is. Now, not only does this give the game a nice sense of progression, but it's also mandatory for taking on some of the game's tougher missions. Generally speaking, the planets at the bottom of the map represent the game's easier missions and the planets at the top are the game's tougher missions and as you move up the ranks you'll notice a pretty sharp spike in difficulty unless your ship has been appropriately leveled up to deal with the tougher enemies. This means that it pays to replay some of the various levels either to regenerate your shield or just to get a few extra points in your weapons. But interestingly replaying levels can also lead to completely new levels within the same planets, sometimes bringing you to new locales, new bosses and most importantly of all new story segments. Honestly it can feel a little bit aimless and random them how this all plays out but really no matter where you are or what you do as long as you're winning battles you're always contributing to something and moving the game forward. Now while I would consider this game import friendly for the most part it does pay to know what these pieces of Japanese text say on the map screen. Now these change after each mission and generally give you hints on which planet you should visit next to help move the story along. Sometimes when you finish a mission you'll get brought straight back to the map screen but if you pick the right planet you'll instead be treated to a new story sequence. Now I used Google Lens to translate these and generally just moved to whatever planet it told me to go to next and that seemed to work just fine for me. So I suppose we should finally talk about the story and truthfully early into the game I found it very hard to follow a lot of what was going on here. The game follows two main characters who are members of an allied military team and the early parts of the game follow your characters as they disobey in order to save some friendlies and the repercussions that they face because of that. It's a lot of sci-fi and military jargon and it can be a little hard to keep up with at times but 
As the game goes on, the story begins to shift towards conspiracies, the disappearance of your family members, evil AI, and some deep metaphysical stuff that blurs the lines between good and evil. It's certainly not amazing or even good really, but it is surprisingly ambitious all things considered, and it even ended up being kind of coherent by the end. Truthfully, I'm still kind of amazed that a Japanese studio opted to record the entire thing in English. It certainly benefits my dumbass all these years later, but it's still such an odd thing to experience. Humans weren't meant to be way out here in space, you know? Out in this cold, jet black world. Also, you may have noticed that all the characters are highlighted as coloured silhouettes rather than fully fleshed out or defined characters. Another interesting stylistic choice for sure, but I didn't mind it too much. As for the voice acting, as mentioned before, it is way better than it probably has any right to be. I think the whole cast is comprised of maybe four people in total, and for the most part, it's clear and comprehensible the whole way through. The only character that I had any trouble with was the allied commander who sounds like a garbled robot and is pretty hard to make out. Well, it was when we were heading into enemy territory on an offensive mission. Also, it turns out this character was in fact a robot in disguise the whole time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thanks, sir. Not sure how they didn't figure that one out. Also, let's take a brief moment to talk about the opening movie for this game. This is also in English and has nothing to do with the story of the game at all. It's basically this robot DJ who's going through a list of the top five selling games at the moment featuring such classics as The Highest Dreams, Parisian Mouse, and of course, the top selling game, Metaflist itself. It is so, so bizarre. Dynamite, honey, and Peace Boy 3. Little Marilyn's got this awesome body, see, but because she's riddled with low self-esteem, wraps 500 dynamites around her body. She then meets this young samurai and falls into love. Lots of nice sex and What that? I guess all that's left to talk about then really is the music and presentation, and as for the visuals, well, we've already mentioned that this game is for the most part a busy, distracting mess, but to its credit, it does have some nice parallax scrolling in some of the levels, but the backgrounds range from boring and uninspired to absolutely insane and way, way too distracting for a shoot 'em up even if they're kinda cool. Like I said, I appreciate the balls to the wall, fuck it attitude ADM took with some of this stuff, but if we're being objective, it's not very good at all. The enemy design is also kind of boring and repetitive, the bosses are generally very, very bad, and the OTT gunfire and bomb animations are, like I said, just taking the piss a little bit, even if I kind of love them all the same. And despite all this crazy stuff happening on screen, at least the performance isn't too bad. Depending on the backgrounds of the level you're in, you'll see the game swap from 60 to 30 FPS, and slowdown for the most part was quite minimal outside of a few instances of extreme slowdown. But considering how often this game goes off the rails with the visuals, slowdown is surprisingly rare, all things considered. Also, for the music and sound, it's also kind of a mess. There's tracks here I would consider bangers, tracks I would consider terrible, sound effects I really liked, and others that blew out my speakers. It is once again all over the map. But on the whole, I would say that I liked more of it than I disliked, and truthfully, I would have loved to see the soundtrack for this thing online. Apparently, it did get released on CD, but I, for the life of me, cannot find a rip online. But hey, here's a little sample of some of the game's music, so you can at least get a feeling for it yourself. Emergency, 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 emergency
So yeah, that's a look at Metaflis, one of the most bizarre games I have ever played. I get the feeling it's the type of game somebody could play and genuinely consider one of the worst games ever made. And another person could try it and say it's one of the coolest games that they've ever played. And you know what? I love games like that. Truly unique, batshit, and very, very polarizing. Now, as for me, I think it's got a lot of problems. It's annoying that you can't save mid-game, it goes on a little too long and ends up getting quite repetitive towards the end. And as a shooter, it's uh, mediocre at best. But truthfully, I really kind of love how ambitious and insane it is all the same. A game I can honestly say is kind of bad, but would still recommend people try just to experience it themselves, especially if you're a shoot 'em up fan and wanted to try something so far outside the box that it exists on a different plane of reality. Also, to make it even more strange, it also supports the PlayStation mouse. If you're wondering how, well, you control the ship's movement with a controller and you control the cursor with the mouse. It's actually kind of fun. Who would have guessed? So yeah, Metaflist is a fine example of a messy bad game that's infinitely more interesting and entertaining than a lot of the more coherent and competently made games out there. It's one that I'm happy I got to experience, even if it hurt my eyes a lot and scream go to hell at me often. But sure, why else would I be making these videos? will provide Volume 9's final game and viewer selection this episode is Cosmo Warrior Zero, which made its way to the PlayStation in May of the year 2000, courtesy of legendary arcade developer Taito. This game was chosen for the wheel by KM, two top tier letters, I'm sure we can all agree. Congrats! So first things first, similarly to our previous game, the title of Cosmo Warrior is often spelled two different ways in the West, either as Cosmo Warrior Zero or Cosmo Warrior Ray Zero, and in this case, I believe Cosmo Warrior Zero is the correct title because Ray is just the Japanese word for Zero, and also the title screen just says Cosmo Warrior Zero, so uh, yeah, let's go with that. Now, before we dig into the game itself, we should probably briefly talk about the works of legendary Japanese manga artist Leiji Matsumoto, whose works include the very popular series Galaxy Express 999 and Space Pirate Captain Harlock. And even if, like myself, you've never gotten around to reading or watching anything from these series, if you're an anime fan, you're probably at least familiar with Matsumoto's distinct character designs. He also worked on Daft Punk's Interstellar, so... If it rings a bell, that's probably why. Well, many of Matsumoto's series all take place in the same shared universe, known by fans as the Leijiverse, and today's game Cosmo Warrior Zero is a game that takes place in said universe, bringing together characters from a collection of Matsumoto's works into one big fun video game adaptation. And not only that, Matsumoto himself was involved in the creation of the game, and this even led to an anime adaptation of the same name a year later. So there you go. So what type of game is Cosmo Warrior Zero? Well, 
What we have here is another arena style battle game. If you remember Project Gyre from Volume 8 of Japan Only PS1 games, it's actually not unlike that title. Although truthfully, this game actually reminds me a little bit more of a duo of Capcom arcade titles that reported to the Dreamcast, Heavy Metal Geo Matrix and Spawn in the Demon's Hand. And it's probably no surprise that Cosmo Warrior Zero feels very much like an arcadey game. And even though at its core, it's more or less a fighting game that takes place in a 3D space, it definitely feels like a game that's more focused on quick pick up and play fun rather than the technical depth you'd see in other combat games and hey there's nothing wrong with that plus it's a single player only game so it's not like you're going to be playing in any tournaments anyway. Now before we get into the various modes let's break down the gameplay on offer. Cosmo Warrior is a game played from a hold on let me try say it with a H third person perspective and like many arena style fighting games from this era your directional inputs move you forward and back and turn you left and right. The L1 and R1 buttons allow you to strafe left and right and you can also do a sharp 180 turn by pressing the L2 button. Honestly the movement may look kind of stiff but truthfully it's pretty good and quite easy to pick up and get to grips with. There's no dashing or cancels or any real crazy tech stuff here like you might find in mech based arena fighters. So this does feel like a more beginner friendly entry to the genre. Rounding out the moves you can also dodge in one of four directions by pressing the L2 button and as you can imagine this is very useful for avoiding damage and depending on your character it can also look pretty cool too. And if you're wondering about camera controls well generally it just follows behind your character. It's not perfect but I personally never found it too troublesome. You kind of just auto aim at enemy targets anyway so it's not something you'll ever really worry too much about. Just keep shooting and you'll be fine. Speaking of shooting, all your attacks are mapped to the four face buttons. Your basic infinite projectile attack, which is activated using the square button and can also be charged for a more powerful variant. There's also limited bombs, which are mapped to the X button and you can charge these as well to control your throwing range. And you've also got special abilities mapped to the circle button, which are generally your character's strongest moves. Pressing circle at range unleashes a special ranged attack. And if you get up close to your opponent, you can press circle to do an incredibly powerful melee attack, which oftentimes can take nearly half an opponent's life bar and almost always looks really badass. In some cases certain characters might also have a second special ability which is mapped to the triangle button. For example some characters can activate a temporary shield or even turn invisible which is about as OP as it sounds. Although when a character has a bonus ability like this it usually means they are gimped in some other way. For example these characters have no bonus abilities but can fire while strafing and this character has a shield but can only fire while standing still so it kind of balances out. The game has a roster of 8 different characters total, representing characters from across the Legiverse, which isn't a huge amount really, but to its credit, each character has different projectiles, bombs, special attacks and melee abilities, so there is a lot of gameplay variety here, regardless of the low roster number. As for the battle arenas themselves, well there's one for each character and they all tend to offer up some hiding spots, destructible objects and plenty of visual differences to give each location its own style. There's nothing really too dynamic or different between them on the gameplay front to really make them stand out beyond the visuals but I do think they complement the 1v1 gameplay well enough and do make for fun combat arenas. Also I should probably talk about this incredibly large hood. Now I actually kind of like it just because it's uh, really extra I guess you could say but if you want it out of the way you can just press select and get a nice basic hood instead so it's nice that the choice is there. And yeah that's about it for gameplay. So what about the game modes? Well we have two on offer. Your standard arcade mode where you pick one of the game's eight characters and fight the entire game's roster one after another and see how quickly you can do it. Beating arcade mode with a character will then unlock you some artwork which can be viewed in the game's gallery mode which is always a welcome addition in any game. Although if I'm being honest arcade mode is really just a side piece to the game's main single player content which is the story mode. Now the plot revolves around our title character Zero who lost his wife and child in a great war between humans and machines. Fast forward into the future and the great war is finally over and Zero is now captain of an earth fleet ship called the Great Fire Dragon working alongside the newly allied machine men tasked with capturing the great space pirate Captain Harlock. Our quest will take us from planet to planet in search of Captain Harlock, but things slowly begin to unravel and ain't all what they originally seem. Now, there is a decent chunk of story segments in this game, all of which play out using fully voiced cutscenes that use static images, of course, without subtitles, so I have no way of actually picking up on what's happening in the story segments here. But realistically, this is the only part of the game that I would say is locked out to non-Japanese speakers, and while there is a lot to take in here for fans of the series, 
They really don't take up too much time and are completely skippable if you like. It's a shame the scenes aren't fully animated like the game's opening cutscene, but the stills are at least nicely detailed and colourful all the same. Now as you'd expect, the parts in between the story involve you fighting various enemies across different planets, just like arcade mode. But what actually makes the story mode pretty cool is that it also features exclusive sections that play more like a traditional single player action game. You'll wander around levels with branching paths, collect items, pickups and search out a few new pieces for the gallery, find keys to open new areas and even take on the odd mini boss here and there. These to me were honestly such a nice addition to the game. Almost every planet has one of these prior to you making it to the big fight at the end and while the gameplay doesn't exactly change much, the different objectives, enemies and locales were always a lot of fun to experience for the first time. In particular, the train from Galaxy Express 999. There's just something cool about battling on a galactic space train, you know? There's even one strange level that features no combat and changes to a sort of tank control style adventure game where you explore a house with some cats, a weird bird that yells a bunch, and you can even talk to Leiji Matsumoto himself if you like, complete with some voice dialogue. <laughs> Now while these sections aren't exactly the pinnacle of gaming excellence by any stretch of the imagination, they do act as a nice palate cleanser in between the various 1v1 battles and story sections, and really just add to making the story mode feel like a nice complete single player package. And it also makes it feel like the game is going above and beyond, not just in terms of a fun story for fans of the Legiverse, but just a fun arcadey single player experience. The game could have left it at the fights, but having all this here too, it's just such a nice bonus. Now beating story mode will probably take most people anywhere from 40 to 50 minutes and doing so is how you unlock new characters for use in arcade mode and also how you unlock more characters for story mode. There's up to a total of four different story mode experiences. Now these generally cycle through the same few levels just with some changes to the order and structure of the stages but the main difference really is getting to experience the story from a different perspective so your mileage on these may vary. It is a shame that it's only available for four of the game's eight characters but if you want to unlock all eight characters anyway you'll have to play through the story mode with each available character and sure look it's a fun time so you might as well. So yeah, while the combat and gameplay isn't exactly the most refined and technical that this genre has to offer, it does provide a fun, arcadey, story-centric single-player experience, which honestly, if you know Taito, isn't all that surprising. I would say the game has some annoying issues, mostly regarding some brain-dead AI annoyingly overpowered attacks and the game's obnoxiously long recovery animations, but for the hours that I spent with this thing, it was a pretty good time even for somebody who's not well-versed in the source material. All that leaves us with then is the sound and presentation, which truthfully is probably where my biggest issues with this game lie. Now, visually, I think it's a pretty nice looking game. Nothing too stunning, especially by 2000 standards, but some of the area design and visuals I do quite like, especially the later levels that take place on big battleships, and also this funky blue mushroom zone, which sounds like the name of a scrap level from a 16-bit Sonic game. That being said though, the textures aren't the sharpest and most detailed that you'll ever see, and while I do like the character models overall, they are very prone to a bit of the old clipping, which you really don't love to see. The music, on the other hand, is probably what I found to be the most disappointing aspect of the game because there's times where you get these great intense tracks that invoke the spirit of classic grand anime battles, which is exactly what you'd want from a game like this. <laughs> But the vast majority of the time, the game gives us music that can quite literally last 20 seconds and doesn't loop. <laughs> Levels that opt for mostly dull ambient background noise. Or some levels that just outright don't have any music. It's odd enough that there were times where I thought my game might be defective, but nope. 
This is just how the game is. And the fact there's rare times where the game knocks it out of the park with the music makes it all the more disappointing. Although one saving grace is that the game's sound effects are absolutely stellar. There's not a bullet, special move, or explosion that doesn't evoke that iconic classic anime sound. And I wish the music was given as much attention as the sound effects, but hey, it's a nice consolation prize at the very least. So that's Cosmo Warrior Zero, a fun single player arena combat title filled with fan service and love for the Legiverse. And while it's a game that I would definitely recommend, it still features a lot of shortcomings that plague the genre even to this day, most notably a simple battle system that lacks the technical depth to keep people sticking around when they've run through the game's content. But between the numerous story segments, various action levels, fun battles and unlockable characters and artwork, there's definitely enough to keep fans of arcadey action sticking around for a few hours at least, and as long as you don't mind skipping a few story segments, the game is also very import friendly too, so if you like what you see or are a fan of Leiji Matsumoto's work, this is a game that is definitely worth your time. Also, you get to hang out with cats and a bird, and look, I don't know about you, but I would pay good money for that any day of the week. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I hope you enjoyed yet another trip into the depths of the PS1 library to sample a little more Japan-only PS1 goodness. Today, we got to check out a game full of bugs, but in a good way, a tennis game made by tennis fans for tennis fans. Probably the strangest shoot 'em up I've ever played, and if you know shoot 'em ups, that's really saying something. And finally, a fan service treat for fans of the Legiverse that also happens to be a fun arena battler to boot. Now, as is tradition, we can't close out an episode without first bringing out the old arbitrary ranking system, can we? Were any of today's games a must play? Is it something worth trying if you like the look of it? Is the game just kind of meh? Is the game trash and not worth your time? Or did I find the game unplayable due to the language barrier? Well, Volume 9's entries see World Pro Tennis 98, Metaflist, and Cosmo Warrior Zero making their way into the tri tier, and the lovely Tokyo Insect Zoo adding another notch to the ever growing No Gaijin belt. So look, on the outside, World Pro Tennis 98 isn't exactly the most exciting tennis game ever made, but really, that was never this game's intention. Magnolia developed this game with one goal in mind, to make the most realistic and true-to-life version of the sport available on the PS1, and honestly, unless somebody can point me at another tennis title that rivals it, I think they actually went and accomplished it. Sure, its graphics aren't the most polished, its content is a little lacking, and the gameplay style absolutely won't appeal to everybody, but I still respect and appreciate the depth of the game's mechanics and what it allows you to do compared to other games in the genre. And it's always nice to see games out there that cater specifically to fans of the sport first and foremost. So if you're a hardcore tennis fan or just like a bit of realism in your tennis games, World Pro Tennis 98 should definitely be worth a try. As for Metaflist, well, Depending on who you ask, this might be the worst shoot 'em up on the PS1, but for me, this is truly a diamond in the rough. It's got some glaring flaws and some questionable visual and design choices for sure, but in a way, I was just oddly captivated by this ambitious mess of a shoot 'em up. Once I understood its systems and mechanics, the more I played, the more I enjoyed it. And in the end, I actually found its gameplay to be pretty fun, all things considered. Throwing the novelty of a two disc story that's entirely in English for some reason, some of the most batshit visuals you'll ever see on the console, for better or for worse, and I think even with its problems, this is still a game worth trying. I can't promise that you'll like it, but I promise you, you will 100% remember it. Cosmo Warrior Zero, on the other hand, is a pretty straightforward, fun, arcadey arena battler. It's not the most complex or refined take on this genre that you'll ever see, but with the addition of a cool story mode that features levels to play prior to each fight, some flashy moves, cool locales, and plenty of fan service for fans of the source material, if you like arena battlers, this is one that you really can't go wrong with, even if the fun will only last you a couple of hours when all is said and done. And finally, we have have Tokyo Insect Zoo, and I suppose since the game builds itself as a movie in game form, 
Well, it's no surprise the language barrier kind of stops non-Japanese speakers from really understanding and appreciating what this game is all about. That being said, I still enjoyed my time wandering around and exploring this strange world and all the characters that inhabit it. It's got a lot of personality, charm, and will definitely leave you scratching your head even if you can understand the story, I'm sure. But either way, even though I can't give you a fully informed opinion on the game's quality, I still thought it was a pretty cool experience and another fine example of a cool Japan only PS1 title. Now before we finish up of course I have to give a special thanks to KM for your submission to the viewer wheel. Thank you for bringing some title fun to the masses. If you'd like to submit your choice for a game to appear in future volumes of the series, eh, just throw it in the comments somewhere. I'll probably figure out where it is. And that's about it for volume 9. I can't believe we're somehow already at the cusp of volume number 10, but if you're a watcher of obscure and forgotten PS1 games as well, you'll know that I have something special in store for the big 1-0, so make sure you tune in for that to see what it is. Until then though, as always, a big thank you to everybody for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode as much as I did putting it together for you. I'll be back real soon with some more PS1 goodness, but until then, take care of yourselves, and of course, don't forget to praise the wheel. Thank you.